Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can, just because, I mean, you've kind of gone over our contribution uh, so well. Um, but maybe, and I also want to hear from the other members of the panel, uh, because they're outside members, and I think Burkhardt and I have heard each other's opinion enough. <laughs> so um, I think I just have a couple of things that I think, you know, obviously with a, a report like this, it's hard to encompass everything that comes up. And uh, I was just teaching my last class of the semester today, and someone <laughs> asked me a, a certain question, and, and, you know, I gave the nice canned lawyer's answer in saying, well, it depends. And I think... Uh, the it depends part in this kind of um, endeavor of what to do with these principles is important to think about because there's a whole part of this that I kind of wish could be in there, which has to do with the idea of dimensionality. If really like, how would you apply these principles at different levels at different times with different kinds of motives involved and different kinds of goals involved? And so I think uh, when reading this report, I think it's important to kind of keep in there this one extra dimension of really applying this in the most contextual way possible in each different uh, instance. For instance, one of the things I come up with our principle of ultimate responsibility, which works perfectly fine for, say, a lawyer who's making a choice in, in a decision to employ a tool or not. But it might be different for, say, a caseworker in a public administration who doesn't really have a choice whether to use a tool or not. And, but they still should be wary of these kinds of things, but they're not going to be as mindful of some of these principles as I think, I think all of us hope uh, they would be. The second bit I wanted to say uh, is I think more of a question to the rest of the panel and you know, even attendees if they have uh, opinions in the, in the Q&A section, which is there's an idea that keeps bouncing around uh, at least our faculty and other panels I've been on, which is where do we set the threshold for entry? on using these, these products. Do we say, put the threshold at, right at the human standard as we have now? Meaning, do we look at the consequences of using it and, and look at the consequences for say something like uh, uh, explanation and say if a, if a tool can you give you just as good as an explanation as a human being would and no one could tell the difference, would that be good? And would that be enough to say, okay, we'll allow it in or do we have some kind of extra responsibility to say, well, we have these problems in the system now, and to use these systems, there should be a higher threshold to use them to, uh, to then we have a, a duty to improve the system by using these extra tools. And so I can kind of go half on half and make good arguments in both sides of that. And perhaps it's just a, uh, you know, um, professional hazard of, of being able to be on both sides. But uh, you know, I think it's a question, an open question of whether or not we have um, a real responsibility to in, to improve things and maybe we should set the threshold there. Or do we say, no, we'd rather get these things in so we can iterate them so people will up to, you know, there'll be uptake and people will continue to use these kinds of tools to make them even better and better. And there's a, you know, there's a uh, almost an efficiency argument in that of it'll, you know, we'll get better results faster if we do it that way. So yeah, that was my my general thoughts. I hope that was uh, good enough for dispersion conversation. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Jacob. And, and I think you you also brought up one of the things that that was interesting for us. Uh, if you compare law, say with medicine, uh, we, we have I think an additional problem. With a medical AI, it works if you get healthy. That's great. Uh, with a legal AI, what counts here as having the correct decision? The first thing I was taught, and I think probably everyone here on the panel when we were in law school first year, there are no right answers. Everything is open for discussion. Everything can be contested. So I think that poses a unique problem that we have as lawyers when we think about evaluating what, what we are doing. I mean, obviously, again, we all know that not all answers are equally good, and we mark our students accordingly. It's, it's not quite, quite like uh, the Wild West that this might be indicating, but I think law is essentially about contestability. Um, things can be challenged. We have a system of challenging ideas through the appeals process, for instance. And that is where I think your, 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 your point becomes uh, ethically salient, um, that this ability to contest, to accept that there are no right or wrong answers, that I might lose today, but society might change and that the attitudes interpretation of that law might change over time. That must be, again, something that shouldn't be foreclosed um, by the deployment of, of, of technology. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Uh, Sophia, you are on my screen as the next victim. <laughs> <laughs>